Hello, my name is David Hand. Um, my uh, online name is Tolemark, which of course is uh, spelled exactly uh, how it sounds. <laughs> and this is my very first talk at a Yapsi. So, yeah. That was, I'm glad that I got that response now because, yeah, later. It's not going to make this happen I mean, no. Okay, so this is on the, uh, the, the Linux in at RamFS for fun and, um, uh, well, it's about the Linux in at RamFS for, uh, for, 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 anyway, it's about the Linux initial file system. So, in at RamFS is a small file system embedded in the Linux kernel image that helps the kernel to mount the root file system. So, the x86 boot process. Let's talk about that for just a second. So, you start with the, U the UEFI firmware. Um, we, uh, we used to call that the BIOS. That hands off to a bootloader. That to, unfortunately, part of this is not displaying on my presenter console. That uh, passes off to uh, uh, the kernel, which um, has within it uh, the initial RAM file system, and that gets you to PID1, which is usually init or systemd or something like that. So let's take them step by step. So UEFI firmware. Here's a diagram of it. Um, don't worry, I will, uh, I'll cover this uh, you know, throughout the talk. You know, I'll go step by step. Just kidding, I'm, that's the last one we talk about the firmware. <laughs> so. Uh, that passes off to the bootloader. Now, people have a hard time with, people have given UEFI uh, a, a very hard time, and there are some good reasons for that, but um, most of those have to do with secure boot. EFI is actually really, really easy. So I want to just mention this real quick because it really, really is easy. So uh, the important thing is that, you, that it boots from, instead of, instead of with the BIOS, where it's like this weird thing that's, that should have been part of the file system, but we didn't use it for the file system, so instead we're using it for this other thing. Uh, EFI uh, looks for a very particular partition. It has to have, so you have to have a, a, partition, a particular partition type, which is GPT. It looks for a very particular FAT32 partition with uh, uh, particular flags, and then it finds a file, and by default, that's where it's located. Um, and then it just runs that file. It's just an ELF executable with, 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 with extra headers. So, the bootloader loads the kernel, and here is the kernel. We will, uh, let's see, we can um, kind of scroll through uh, and uh, look at, you know, the, the, the met no, we're not gonna do that. So, why is that not, pardon me? Okay, so, um, that hands off to the kernel. The kernel has inside of it the init ramfs. Let's pause on that for a second. First, what does the init ramfs need to do on the other end? So it passes off to PID1. PID1 is not part of the kernel, right? It's just a normal user space program. It needs to have everything, like it needs to have present everything it's going to need in order to be able to run. Now, what does PID need in order to be able to run? Basically everything at first, at least, it needs, it needs a, a full system available to it right then. Now, it doesn't need, for example, your home directories, right? Um, it, in fact, it, it's part of its job to load your, you, you, the, uh, the partition on which your home directories live, but it needs more or less the full file system um, before it can start. So the initRamFS job is to provide that full file system. So again, what's the initRamFS? It is a small file system embedded in the Linux kernel image that helps the kernel to mount the root file system. So let's talk about that part. So why would your, wh 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 where, where is the root file system usually located, right? In the normal case, there, right? It's just, that's, and, and in that case, you, you probably don't need an init ramfs. You just need to pass the partition name to your kernel. So, but what if it's more complicated, right? So you could use NFS. This is Pixie, okay? Pixie is a, uh, is a system by which, um, 
Let's see how if I can do this. So you uh, you consult uh, the, the the firm the firmware consults a particular kind of DHCP daemon. The DHCP returns uh, an address uh, that, that tells you where you could you should actually load the kernel image from, and it does that. But it can only one, load one file, right? You don't need initRAMFS for this, but you're going to need initRAMFS for the next step because Pixie has only handed you one file. Now. Uh, the init RAMFS is contained within that file, so that's pretty, pretty darn handy. Um, and, and from then, you're going to want to mount whatever you're, you're going to want to mount. But um, uh, to boot from Pixie, for example, you're going to need an, an init RAMFS, probably a custom one. So here's another reason. So um, uh, I like messing with my laptop, and I had a laptop with three hard drives, which is a little bit weird. Um, so. Uh, the, the first hard drive, SDA, was a, uh, a fairly fast um, uh, SSD. SDB and SDC were uh, larger uh, uh, spinning rust drives, right? And when, uh, it was my first Mac, or I'm sorry, it was my first Linux computer after having had a Mac. And um, uh, I was, um, what, jealous of the full disk encryption. So um, I wanted to, you know, I wanted that. So what I did was um, I put... Uh, Luke's, which is the, uh, the encrypted file system thing for Linux, um, and it actually doesn't expose a file system, it exposes a partition again, right? So um, on top of that, I sat LVM, and then on top of that, a whole bunch of weird partitions, some of which spanned the uh, you know, SDB and SDC, some you know, striping for some of them, I don't know, I just messed up, you know, messed around with it. Uh, it, it. Logical was probably the, uh, probably not quite the right word for it. So again, what's initRAMFS? It is a small file system embedded in the Linux kernel image that helps the kernel to mount the root file system. Let's talk about the embedding in the Linux kernel image. So, <laughs> so who, who would like to watch me uh, uh, compile a kernel? <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, how does it get into the kernel, though, um, by being compiled in? So, uh, this is make menu config. Um, uh, I, ha I have gone into general setup and uh, uh, I don't know, halfway down, we have um, uh, initial RAM file system and RAM, RAM disk support. So um, if, I, if, I, if I select that and then I go to RAM FS, init RAMFS source files, this is it, and that's really friendly. The help, uh, well, I guess that clears it right up. Yeah. It's yeah, you know, it's a CPIO archive uh, with a CPIO suffix, for God's sake. Um, anyway, so uh, basically, though, it comes down to these, these two config, uh, config variables. Um, config block dev initrd and config initramfs source. Now, for just a second, let's talk about a synonym of initramfs. That's initrd. It's kind of not a synonym. So initrd used to be, well, did I? Yes. So let's talk about. So init init rd used to be these files that sat uh, in your boot partition, and the kernel would load them. Now I say used to, but that's that's actually my boot directory right now. Okay, it's still there. And for some reason, when we split off the init ramfs into its own file, which we can do, it's called an init rd. People people tend to call it an init an, an init rd. That said, I, I, uh, I mentioned that uh, it's not quite the same thing because if you end up digging into the documentation, you should know that initrd has a slightly different um, API under the hood. So, okay, the, the, uh, the, the, the secret about the initramfs is there's always an initramfs. So, um, the, whether, there, whether or not you compile one in, whether or not you turn on that one variable, there's always an innate RAMFS. It may be null, but it's still present. So, okay, innit RAMFS is a small file system embedded in the Linux kernel image that helps the kernel to mount the root file system. So, in what way is a small file system embedded in the kernel image? Now, I don't just mean the kernel runs it. That's true for all, for all well, for most file systems. Um, and I don't mean that, like, 
I don't know. I mean, it's so my, what I do mean is that it's actually in the kernel image. It's in the kernel file unless you split it out. But even then, it loads it into the, it loads it into RAM in kernel space in the kernel image. So um, let's talk about what that is. So in initRAMFS, it is a RAM disk. No, um, it, the RAM disk is an old thing. It's, it's still available, but RAM disks was the RAM disk was a uh, a way of carving off a, uh, a, a block device out of RAM, um, and then what? You could do things with it, like you could do to block devices. For example, uh, uh, you could write a file system to it, right? But with a, with a RAM disk, you would create the device, and then you would like make FS something, right? You would actually have to, you'd have to format it as a disk. So RAM disk is cool for what it does, but that's not what we use. So there's this other thing called RAMFS. RAMFS is really, really slick. So it is not a block device. It is, I mean, it's a file system. And that's cool also because you don't actually have to uh, format it. It is already a file system. It's also kind of neat because it, it live, it's, like it, it's built out of the thing that caches files. When you read, when you read them and write them in Linux, right, it, it automatically caches the writes and uh, you know the, the reads. It might it might save those for you, right, in the buffers. Um, so um, RAMFS is actually just that. Only there's no underlying file system. Okay, tempfs. Tempfs is basically RAMFS, but you can put limits on it, and you can like let users do things with it. Also, okay, you can you, know, you can have a, you, you can make it so that users can mount their own little tempfs. Um, so rootfs. Rootfs is a tempfs or a RAMFS that exists even if you haven't installed and like even if you haven't done anything else. Um, uh, it is there before you've mounted your own root there's already rootfs. In fact, after you've mounted your own root, rootfs is still there. You just mount over it. So, initRAMFS, oh yes. initRAMFS then, well, <laughs> there's always a rootfs also, right? So, okay, initRAMFS sits on top of it. So I said that there, the, that there were these uh, two variables and one of them you just turn on. This other one, config init ramfs source. So you can give it directly a CPIO file. So let's talk about that. CPIO, um, it's not tar. It is completely something else, and it's a bit weird. Um, I don't know, well, I can tell you why it's, uh, uh, it was chosen over tar, but I wasn't convinced. Um, but anyway, it was. So. Uh, apparently, the tar format is actually even uglier than CPIO, or at least according to the kernel developers. So you can give it a CPIO file, you can give it just a directory, you can, or you can give it more than one directory, um, or you can give it a specification file. So if you give it a directory, you are, of course, I mean, you're, you're obviously uh, trying to, well, let me back up. The init MFS is also kind of a full complete system. In particular, it needs dev. Right? It needs dev TTY, otherwise where is it going to output anything? Um, it needs, um, let's see, uh, all, sorts of other, all sorts of other special files. Now, you are obviously uh, compiling your kernel as a non-root user, right? Okay, well, you should be. And if you do, it's hard to have a directory with special files in it that you've, not, that you've created as a non-root user, right? In fact, the special word for hard is impossible, I think. So. Uh, instead, you can use what's called a specification file. So um, that's what I prefer to do. Now, the thing is, you can also have a mixture. Well, you can have a mixture of either of the either of the last two, and they're processed in order. Um, for example, one thing you can do is, is just have a raw directory with all the files you need in it, okay, and then have a specification file that applies uh, the uh, the special files and whatever. Uh, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, um, uh, owners, right? The, the ownership of, of of all of those files and whatever. So, I actually prefer to use a specification file entirely. So this is my specification file, and we are. This should have been a twenty-minute talk. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so. 
So um, this is uh, my, specif my specification file. I apologize that it's a little bit hard to read. So um, uh, you can see that we, we ha it's, it's just like what kind of file, where is it going to be, what are, what, are, what are its permissions, and who owns it. There are a bunch of them because I have lots of stuff. Um, ignore the microcode thing. So we, you, know, we, we, you start over, when you're starting, you don't have dev null. You have to say, I need dev null, right? Um, you don't have dev zero. You don't have dev mem, which is unfortunate. Um, so um, <laughs> you don't have dev standard out, which is unfortunate. So uh, now, what goes in the init ramfs, right? What is it supposed to do? First, it needs to mount all of the file systems that are, that are necessary for PID1 to run, right? That is its one core responsibility. Incidentally, it can do all sorts of other things. Uh, while you're doing that, you could have, I don't know, Tetris loading while you download your, or you know, Tetris playing while you download your, uh, your, your root file system from 4chan to, I don't know, you know, right? You know, over, I don't know, uh, you know, HTTP, but not HTTPS, right? Just to make sure, you know. So, um, but you, so you can do anything you want. It, it, the init ramfs is a full user space, okay? Now, what is in that user space? init, okay? Now, this is not the same init as before. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> pardon me. This is not the same init as later. So this is not the init that is, that is PID1 on your system, though this is PID1, okay, at this particular moment. Um, and it can, it can be in any format that the, that the, that the uh, kernel can run. Importantly, do you see this shebang line, shebang bin busy box, right? Um, the kernel is what interprets that shebang line, right? Um, it's not, for example, the shell, right? So um, you make sure that you have an interpreter in your init RMFS, and then you have a script that uses that interpreter, right? And you can move on, move on from there. So this is, this is the init that I made. Um, it's a little bit weird, um, but let's jump to the end. So do you see this exec switch? I apologize that it's small. Do you see this as exec switch root target init? Okay. Um, you may remember what exec is, uh, for perhaps the exec uh, uh, built in in Perl. Exec does not so much uh, start, uh, start another program as become that another program, right? So um, this PID1 is going to be your new PID1. It's just, it's going to be different code. But th 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 that line there is the, is the line that does that. So switch root, let's talk about that for a second. Switch root's a bit weird. Um, I said that you mount a different root on top of this one, right? Cool. Where does this one go? And what do I do in the meantime when I don't have, like, I'm kind of between roots or so? Fortunately, you don't have to care. Um, switch, I mean, you can. Uh, switch root, however, does that, right? So it, it accepts a, um, uh, a new uh, part. So it, it expects something else to already be mounted at target, okay? And then once that happens, it expects something relative to target, mind you, um, like relative to target as a new root. Uh, it expects something to run. So that's the init, okay? Um, so that's, that would be, for example, uh, system D, okay, in all likelihood. So, um, and I apologize, whoops. Mm. This is my last slide because I, yeah, but, um, but there's a lot to talk about in it. So, um, okay, so in here, the main thing that you need to do, so I, this is actually the init that I use to do that weird, uh, what, illogical uh, volume management, right? So here I am actually decrypting, well, that's actually, okay. I, it was a little bit weirder than that. So you wanna hear my init, okay. So I had a weird USB key. It had, a, um, it had the decryption key for the rest of the system. It was itself encrypted. Um, I had to type in the password, 
what, with the key in, then I had to remove the key, it would decrypt the, uh, the, the rest of the system and then, and, and then boot. I'm not so much paranoid as just bored. So, um, <laughs> my, uh, and, and my yak is so very smooth. So, uh, so this, this is how it handles the USB key. Um, th then this is how it handles the, uh, the decryption key on the USB key. Um, it forced me to, uh, like, it actually forced me to remove it because so, I wanted to make sure that, like, I don't know. Eh, anyway, it's another vector for attack. Uh, and then um, now that it's decrypted everything, uh, it, well, okay, no, I'm sorry. This is the decryption. Activates LVM. Oh, we should talk about hibernation in a second. Uh, uh, activates LVM and then mounts everything, right? We're going to skip that. And then, um, well, and then we, we, we move a couple of things. For example, uh, 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 you know, we, we've, we've had to mount dev, right? We, 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 you need a dev, right? Uh, but we are going to also need that dev in the new system, so we just move it, right? So there's cer certain things like that. At that point, we have a full root file system. Right? We have root, we have user, right? uh, we have everything that systemd needs in order to start. Um, let's talk about a couple of the weirder things. So, I'm sorry, just a second. So, restoring for, from hibernation. If you want to restore from hibernation, you need an init RAMFS. That said, if you're running Red Hat, Gen 2, whatever, they, or I'm sorry, Ubuntu or whatever, they provide you an init RAMFS and it, has, it, it expects to be able to restore you from hibernation. Um, this is what you do if you're writing your own. Um, you basically just find, you, you find the major and minor number of the, the swap partition on which the hibernation, the hibernation image is stored and you pass it to a file, SysPower Rescue. It's actually, uh, it's, it's kind of odd. It's, a, it's, it's, it's this weird thing where you're expecting it to be harder than it was. So. Um, if you don't, like if you pass it something nonsense, it just doesn't do anything, and then you pr proceed on your init or MFS init script, right? Um, if it does actually have a, uh, a, um, a hibernation image on it, this stops executing, right? Because you're now just loading something completely else into RAM with, a, with its own state, and it just, it just starts from there. So it's actually pretty slick. Um, oh. oh. That is the basics of this init script. You see, though, like I said, that it's not a binary, right? You would, you'd, you'd kind of expect something so low level to be have, that you have to write, write it in C, and you, know, and you certainly can. Um, but you can just use, a, a, um, uh, you can just use an, an interpreted language. I, <laughs> Next year, maybe I'll show you an init, uh, an init RAMFS init script written in Perl 6. You know, I don't know. Um, there's, in principle, there's no reason why you can't. Um, actually, I should pause for a second and say, and go back here. Whoops. Pardon me. So, you may object. If you know anything about init RAMFS, you may object when I say that you could use Perl 6, right? Because how are you going to statically link Perl 6? Are you going to make one monolithic Perl 6 binary? How can you use shared libraries in an, in an, in an init RAMFS, right? Whenever anybody talks about init RAMFS, they talk about, you know, statically linked, you know, we don't have to, we can't deal with libraries. It's false, right? It is more convenient if you have a statically linked single binary, but only because you, you only have to include fewer, like it requires fewer lines in this line, or in this file. So in fact, here are the dynamically linked libraries that everything else requires. Um, there is a, a fairly simple command, um, ld tree, that you can use to, uh, to find out what the uh, uh, libraries are that are required by your binary, and you just include them simply. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I apologize. My, this, my, my, my dismount is perhaps a, a bit more awkward than my, uh, my start, but this is pretty much it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Or can you use the drives that are already there? 
So I, I think the question is, um, is an innate RAMFS required just to boot from USB? No. Um, so, right. so that would be like why you would not check that box in the, in the, the kernel build process. Right. The question is like why, why is that even an option? Right, right, right. So if your, if your file system is, lo is local, right, um, and that includes USB, then um, it is not necessary to have an init RAMFS. Um, technically, there is still one, um, and what it, I believe what it, what it has in it is let's find the first, uh, the first partition and, of the first drive and just try it, right? Um, if you don't want to do that, you pass along the partition and the drive as a boot parameter, right? Um, uh, now, if you're booting from USB, in all likelihood, what you've done is you've told your bootloader to look for the EFI boot image on USB, okay? Um, in, especially if you have a m more modern computer uh, that, that does not have the old weird BIOS way of doing things as a fallback, okay? Some computers will try one and then try the other, okay? Um, if you are trying to boot and you don't have the, the, old, uh, the old way of, of working, then basically your USB needs to be partitioned with, with GPT. It needs to have a, a, a FAT32 file system with those, with those particular boot flags enabled, and then you have to have something in that, you, you have to have a file named that in that directory, right? Uh, but, uh, you, but that on its own does not require an init RAMFS. Yes? I do not believe there is one. Um, that is, or, or that is to say, I'm sure that there is one, but it's probably something like, you know, uh, has to do with like buffer overflow on a 64-bit int or something, right? Um, uh, I have, the init RAMFS, the, the main problem that I've had with size on my init RAMFS is that I was silly and I made my boot partition too small and I wanted to keep too many backup kernels, <laughs> right? So um, as a practical matter, it was just, you know, I couldn't store them all, so I was trying to shrink my init RAMFS a bit. Um, that said, um, do you run Linux? Yes. So uh, uh, you notice how, as you're booting, it's very rare that you actually see a bunch of boot scrolling messages go by, right? Um, that's because there is a program called um, I'll come back to that, I'll try to remember that. Uh, but th there is a program that uh, um, uh, provides a, a, you know, a splash image, right? Um, that, like I say, an init RAMFS can be arbitrarily complicated. You can do absolutely anything, right? You could have Firefox running, right? Because you have all the, 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 the libraries, right? You just make sure that you put all the libraries in your init RAMFS, right? You could have Firefox and it's like, here, browse Facebook while I, I don't know, find an image off of UUCP, uh, you know, right? You see what I'm saying? So um, uh, there is no particular size or complexity limit that's, that's given to you by outside for your init, or init RAMFS. That's an excellent example, thank you. We used to very often have to have SCSI drivers in our Let me repeat that for, uh, the, uh, for the record. Uh, so, um, yes, so if, for example, your SCSI drivers are not compiled directly into your, into your kernel, uh, and there, one reason for that could be because they're binaries, right, and therefore it's illegal or, you know, a uh, violation of copyright, violation of the GPL to, 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 com to, to compile them directly into the kernel, right, so they have to be shared, le what is it, um, um, modules, but there's, a, there's another word besides, before module, anyway, uh, but, uh, but, you know, separate, separate modules that are not compiled directly into the kernel. Um, uh, loadable, there we are. Um, uh, and yet, 
they have to be loaded into the kernel in order for you to mount your weird SCSI system with its proprietary uh, drivers, um, then you need to put that module in your NitRamFS. And actually, in my example, that was a huge lacuna. So thank you for pointing that out. Because usually, actually, in a NitRamFS, is most frequently used for loading kernel modules. So um, uh, in particular, it has to be there to load kernel modules for things that are going to be required to boot. Another example is sometimes, I mean, you could theoretically have your, have, uh, your USB uh, uh, support on a kernel module, in which case you would indeed need an NitRamFS to boot off USB, though hopefully your NitRamFS isn't on the USB. Um, uh, let's see. Um, in fact, actually, my, uh, the example in which I uh, was mounting off of, you know, uh, LVM on top of Luke's is actually a special case of, of the case uh, that was just given, right? So this is a situation in which the, you know, the, what is it, the serial ATA drivers on which my actual uh, uh, drives depend, those are built, compiled into the kernel, but the data that they contain is this weird format. Well, it's you know it's it's it's, it's, it's you know statistically random noise, right? Until you until you load the particular uh, uh, program that can that can read it, and then on top of that you have yet another thing, right? So that's actually uh, uh, an analogous thing to needing to load your SCSI drivers. So, okay, right. So, well, the, actually, I should uh, make something clear. As, as I said, as, as I tried to make this diagram reflect this, uh, the EFI boot partition is not part of the encrypted space, right? That has to be a, a normal, unencrypted FAT32 partition sitting in a GPT partition table on a normal spinning disk, or, you know, or whatever. It doesn't have to be spinning, but, you know, normal, a normal drive, right? Um, so to answer your question about how to, how to restore it, so in fact, this is something I had to do. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the computer was essentially destroyed by being in checked luggage and being thrown by, anyway, that was a bad idea. But um, so what did I do, right? So I pulled the, uh, I pulled the drive out. Um, I went into the EFI system partition, Got, got my kernel image, right? My NitRamFS was actually in the kernel rather than a separate file, right? That would have been a little bit easier. Um, it turns out that <laughs> using a very strange, uh, like, um, uh, CPIO output command that I had to look up, uh, you can extract the NitRamFS from the kernel, at which point I have the decryption key for, the, for my external USB key, right? So then I decrypted that. Got got the decryption key off of that for the for the rest of the systems, and then by God copied those in plain text somewhere, right? So that I could actually uh, you know restore without having to do this every time. Buddy. Yes. Sure. Well, I yeah I'll I'll do that without actually using a slide. So. Um, the slide was no help anyway. So CPIO. Um, well, actually, I guess which 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 CPIO thing do you mean? Why CPIO rather than tar? Well, I mean, like, what is it? Is it it's a compression format that's similar to tar? It is. It's it is. It, it is. It's older. Um, say again. Yes. Sorry. So what is CPIO? And there we are. So. What is CPIO and why it was it used rather than tar for this format? Um, the answer is that it's older. Um, I don't know a lot of details about it, but it is considered to be more regular than tar. Apparently, tar is actually not a format as such. It is a command <laughs> that reads what it reads, right? So, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you, have, do, you have, do you have a way of answering this? Yeah. TAR was originally developed in the days when disk drives were slower than tape, and they were tiny. So what you do is, the thing that TAR can do that CPI can do as well is you can stack volumes, and you can add new things on the tape. So TAR's got a lot of stuff in it, and it's splicing new information on the tape. CPIO stands for copy in out. The one thing that makes CPIO a nicer is you can find 
very useful for backing up a root volume, especially when you need to build things like the device files for your root volume. And yes, that is. CPIO was picked because you can put a subdirectory somewhere to find dot, sort through whatever, pipe into CPIO by so it might be out of GZIP and stick that in, in a particular directory. Right, thank you very much. So, um, uh, Yes, the, <laughs> the, 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 so there are, there, are, there, are, there are a few important things in, in, in what uh, Mr. Lembark just said, but um, the, the part that, that is perhaps the most important is that tar can't really tar up a device special file, right? Um, and CPIO has a way of representing that it should be a particular device special file with particular major and minor number and particular, particular uh, permissions and all of this. So uh, that is, of course, essential for uh, init RMFS. If that is it, then I'm going to get out of here and drink something. <laughs>